So the, the talk I'm giving tonight is about development of a new product and actually commercialization, which I'll define in a moment. If you're a coder, how do you survive in this environment and how do you thrive? This is the talk that no one gave me 20 years ago, so I'm get, sharing it with you. So here's the outline. Uh, we're going to take a moment to define what is new product development and commercialization. That's going to be helpful. And then I'm going to give two extremes of uh, how folks talk about new product development. Once again, I only got the version from the uh, MBAs mostly. Okay, so I'm giving you. I'm going to give you the other side. Uh, <coughs> that I'm going to define a couple of ways what it means to win because I'm, I'm in this to win, not just to collect a paycheck. Um, then I'm going to talk about something I've I've been developing myself called development options. So I'll explain what that is, and then. Uh, the meat of the talk is going to be six ways to synthesize and exercise more attractive options. So I don't want to just say you have options, like two bad ones, I want two better ones. And finally, I'm going to end up with something I'm just developing this year called Focus and Expectations, uh, which is a little broader version of a topic that you might have heard of, usually called Visage and Execution, which ties back into the two approaches to product development. And then in the end, uh, you're going to still get to code, but you're going to be a coder with a better perspective. In fact, a more powerful perspective. You'll be more, I think, perhaps if you choose to follow some of these steps, more respected even. So that's sort of the promise of the night, so we'll see if we get there. So <clears throat> as you, some of you know, I like South Park, and in season two they had a episode about gnomes, and this is, this is a spoof of that. <clears throat> but if you ask someone to explain what product development is, that usually goes something like this. Step one, idea, and then add enough to that idea to at least fill up one or two pages. So not just an idea on a napkin, but I'm, I'm suggesting you have to have at least one or two pages worth. And that might be things like, you know, who's going to buy it, how much might it cost, how long will it take. Some, some Basic things, one to two sheets of paper, and there's various names uh, for these, the format, but it comes down to enough to fill one to two sheets of paper. <clears throat> and then, that's step one. And then they go, and then step three is win. <clears throat> and usually win means abundant sales, abundant profits, um, you know, money, bonuses, whatever. And then you'll notice that's always in terms of what the MBAs like to think about. Okay? So those are, the, those are typically what, it, what is talked about when it talks about win. And then, as in South Park, then somebody raises their hand and says, what is step two? And, and, step, and they go, step one <laughs> is an idea, and step three is win. They go, what is step two? And they go, well, it's just development. You, know, you just tell the guys what you need. And, comes out magically. So we're going to talk mostly about that question mark. A lot, we're going to talk a lot about the question mark in the middle. So here's, the, here's one definition of commercialization. It's from the Product Development and Management Association. And you know, it's their, their pitch on it, but it basically covers the idea. So it says, beside coders, <clears throat> to get a product successfully to market, means you have to do things like have something called launch, uh, ramp up of sales, you might have to have some marketing, <clears throat> you might have to develop a supply chain, how these people get the product, uh, how, you know, where do they buy it, um, you know, do they need training to use it, and then what happens when it breaks, or you know, Apple pushes an update and it stops working. These and you know, other things, this is the definition of commercialization. So, it also means, if you didn't catch it, it means that the product is sold, typically for money. It has competition. There are other choices. Um, and when, when people buy it, they expect it to work. And if they don't, they, they get mad and do all sorts of things. So that, I picked the title Coding to Commercialization because you, you all know what coding is. And we're going to talk about commercialization, which essentially means you have to work with some other people. So <clears throat> this is going to come up a little later, but in the bottom right-hand corner 
are two snowmobiles, two people riding them, and we can guess that they're having fun. And we can guess that when they ride, want to ride them next time, they'll still start and they'll still go, and all those sorts of things. So uh, they produce more than one, and you know, it, when it, this guy hits the ground, it's not going to, like the wheels, the track's going to fall off, so it's going to you know, be uh, sturdy and all that stuff. So we're going to come back to this idea of snowmobile, and, but the key thing is there are people riding it and enjoying it, and that's, they, they paid for that experience. They didn't pay for a showroom photograph and a list of specifications. They wanted to do that. So that, that's called what? It's called user experience, customer experience. This is what they're paying for. So we're gonna, that, that idea is gonna come up again later. Okay, here's what gets a little more interesting. Um, in step one, when, they, when you have this idea and then to get to step three, there's a lot of, lot of forecast, guesses, hypothesis, opinions, and um, that never had a good name that I, under, that I understood. So I'm now calling it just expectations. So it can include all those first items, and there's an expectation that my R&D folks and my marketing folks can actually you know, do all the things that are required. Uh, you know, they're going to meet their schedules and they're going to, if you want a new, newer term, they're going to achieve product market fit and they might make some minimum viable products if you want to put those new words in there. But there are expectations, but once again, their forecast guesses, guesses hypothesis. They're, it's just, a, it's an expectation. That's my bucket word. Okay, so there's also an expectation that some people and budgets and other resources are going to be available. There's an ex somebody decides they're going to have an expectation of certain metrics, milestones, schedules, and timelines. Once again, just an expectation. Um, there's an expectation about what the competition is going to do next year. Once again, just a guess. Uh, there's an expectation that the next reorg is not going to ruin your, uh, your, ruin your team that you're not going to get acquired and that I uh, told somebody else, uh, I've been on projects where the, uh, you know, one of the developers died, you know? So you have some certain expectations going into this, but you're still expected to deliver, deliver something of value at the end. So my somewhat pessimistic statement is the probability of all these being correct is zero, okay? No matter what, how much people argue that I know this, or if we do this feature, my, my customer, I'll, I'll double sales. Those are all guesses. But if you add them all up, probability, zero. Okay, so that's the, what expectations are. They're a set of unknowns that have lots of names, but they're just guesses. Okay, so I'm gonna give just a very brief uh, shopping list of a couple of, that are, couple of them that are popular now. This one's called the Business Model Canvas, and this is popularized uh, by folks, including some folks at Stanford. And uh, they, they made this clever little grid, and they put questions like, uh, what is the value proposition? So you sit around in a room and you figure out some nice words to put in there, and you decide what you think of the customer segments, and you fill out this box, th this grid. And uh, as you learn more, you update it. And then sort of the unwritten thing is when you get it pretty filled in and pretty confident, then you can hand it off to all the other people to implement. That's, that's sort of how it works. Uh, th so anyway, this, one, this one's called Business Model Canvas. It's you know, some, some common phrases put in this box, and this is just a popular item now. There's other versions, but once again, this gets back to this idea of put what you know on one or two sheets of paper, they get you started. Here's another one. Um, the, winners, the winners always tell the story the way they like. So if you're dealing with management, um, in most of the bigger companies around the world for the last 30 or 40 years, they had some version of this. And uh, essentially it's a flow chart and uh, the most popular implementation of this is trademarked and it's called stage gate. And uh, 
essentially you, you pick some area, um, oh, scoping is a good one. Uh, someone decides where the specification is going to be, and then some small group of people work on that. And then uh, on a certain day, uh, those couple of people and, and 10 managers get together and they ask them to explain their progress and they ask them how much money they're going to need next quarter or whatever. And uh, the managers at this uh, diamond shape make a decision and it's the decision is either go, stop, or wait. So uh, these, these gate meetings <laughs> in real life uh, essentially means that all work on the project stops a few days before the gate meeting to get ready for the gate meeting. Then you have a gate meeting and your hopes and dreams are crushed, maybe. Uh, there's also one guy that doesn't like something. Uh, anyway, you work that out so that hopefully you get essentially funded for the next item. And uh, then you complain about the, the meeting for a day or two, then you get back to work. So often these meetings take a big chunk of productivity out of the other group. But anyway, um, one can observe the new product development process from a management perspective. So that's like, you know, C, C, CX people, upper management people, budget people. Uh, they sit in the big chairs, tell you yes, no, or wait. So they map it out and they, you can actually, you know, hire the, the consultant to help guide you through this process. And, Anyway, that's from the manager's perspective, but that's not what we're talking about. I'm just putting it out there to say there's this other perspective that's pretty popular. Um, one of the other new ones um, also originated from, uh, largely from the, the people at IDEO, which are the people that commercialized the first Apple mouse. So there's that word commercialize again. Um, and they, they call their process design thinking. So they've elevated a particular group called designers. And uh, actually what they did was they took out all the, the hard academic credentials and they cherry picked a few things and they put it in this chart so that when they come in they say, we're not just managers, we're now we're designers. So they, they the, the big thing is they talk to customers and empathize with them is one of the words. And they try to figure out what's going to be, you know, what the customer needs. So and they write it all down. And, and essentially what they're doing is saying, in about a year when this product is going to be due, you know, we've prepared some, not just a spec, but a, a sketch of the customer's hopeful experience. And they call that design thinking. So that's big at Stanford and University of Toronto. Uh, now, in addition to a business school, they have a D school, design school. Once again, this is from a certain perspective about how new product development works. Once again, there's no coders in there. This is just people saying, um, we have special knowledge and we want you to, we're going to figure it all out, and then we're going to tell you what to do. So that's what that is. And once again, I'm just giving you a couple of these, and now I'm getting to the, uh, to the one that, you know, more interesting for you. So here's, a, here's another way to think about it. I showed you a snowmobile earlier. Um, I changed the picture a little bit here. This is, this is some little hardware product that has an instruction manual. It connects to some other equipment. There's a website associated with it. There's some packaging associated with it and some, you know, all the, all the things. But when the person buys it, they expect it to, you know, interface with their gear and, and uh, you know, not break. And, you know, when Apple changes, it still works and da-da-da-da-da. So anyway, once again, whenever you imagine that future product, instead of just showing a beauty shot, uh, oops, here's the beauty shot of the laser pointer with a hand model, you, you should really want somebody using the thing. So anyway, so that's, this, this box in the white is called user experience. What does the user think when they're doing their work? And that's ultimately why they're going to buy it, hopefully why they're going to buy it. And I've coined this um, one of the letters slid off there. I've coined this other complementary term. I call it development experience. And that is what the coders think and what the engineers think while they're, while they're slaving away to get this project done. What, what's their experience? Are they just, you know, uh, contract people? Are they, to use a derogatory term, are they just code monkeys? 
or are they actually contributing to the project in some meaningful way? Or are they, or are they just, you know, overpriced uh, people that want fancy dinners or something? So anyway, I've, I've adopted this term, the development experience. Once again, it's what the, what the coders feel, what the engineers feel. And, and another way of saying it is, we're the people with skin in the game. If something breaks, we're staying overnight to fix it. And if it's got to be due on Monday, we're the ones working on the weekend, et cetera. That's called skin in the game. So we'll, we'll be exploring uh, this picture. So essentially what we got here is at the beginning, the time's going that way. At the beginning, you might have this, the same group of three or four people that you know, start to fill in the idea a little bit. Um, so at the beginning, the user experience might just be you know, a couple of documents. And then as things progress, you fill in, you build some stuff so that it starts looking like the actual commercialized product. So this, this is the environment that you actually work in. So in this picture, there aren't so many managers or designers from Stanford or high price consultant. These are the people that are working nights and weekends to fix stuff. These are, this is us. Okay, so it's helpful and I say it's critical to differentiate two, two, two words. Uh, we, we like to use the word done. Uh, the feature needs to be implemented. I evaluated it during my sprint. I did this and that and the other. I did TDD. I tested it. I moved the Kanban board from over here to the done column. It's checked in. It's integrated. It's done. So we, we like to do that, and, and there are some people that uh, like to play uh, planning poker and uh, commit to Git and have a KMM board in the background and make burn down charts and, and say that all these, things, all these things were done. Okay, but in a commercialized product, eh, not really done. Because if, if the user, if it doesn't make it to the end where users pay money, it was just a waste of time or it broke or it, Got, got erased or whatever happened, but it's, you know, we checked it in, but it, it's a, what, the, the key thing is it's a proxy metric. It doesn't actually mean we were successful, it just means we've got some code checked in that may or may not get used. If our company gets sold, it may get thrown away. That's all that happened, it's a proxy metric. The real metric we want is winning. You know, I, I invested a year of my life in this. I, um, you know, missed the softball league I was going to join. Uh, you know, put on 30 pounds, whatever. Um, and at the end, you want to say, I got paid, but that was a terrible year of my life. Or that was the best project I ever worked on. So um, this fellow that I've been studying, his name is, he ended up re retiring as a colonel in the Air Force. His name is John Boyd. And it turns out during his career, he had, uh, he wanted several things. Uh, one, he was a fighter pilot. <clears throat> he, he uh, very successful in that area. I could spend hours talking about that, but I'll just say he was a fighter pilot and he taught at the fighter weapons school which is the Air Force's elite group of the best pilots in the world. Okay? So uh, right a few doors down from the fighter weapons school is the Thunderbirds, the aerial, aerial team. And so people went back and forth between those two groups. Like you could, you could be an instructor at fighter weapons school. And if that wasn't good enough, you could be a Thunderbird. Then you could go back to you know, bombing, you know, bombing some country and then back to Thunderbirds, or whatever. So this is a big deal. So that's another, another whole talk, but he did that. Uh, by the way, he was undefeated. Uh, big deal about winning, undefeated. Uh, next, he, he basically said that the planes that we have uh, aren't adequate against the enemy. So when most fighter pilots complain, they just complained. This is, it's a dog, a blah, blah, blah. But this guy, <laughs> Um, learned calculus on the you know, nights and weekends and he I interacted with the manufacturers and then eventually he developed this, this whole new theory called EM, which e uh, energy, maneuverability, energy Maneuverability Theater 
theory, which can compare a US plane to, a, let's say, a Soviet plane across the flight envelope, flying high, flying slow, flying fast, turning, da-da-da-da-da, so that you could say, in a dogfight at 30,000 feet at this speed, this guy has the advantage or this guy has the advantage, et cetera. So he, he uh, instead of just complaining about the problem, he put some math and science and, com and, st and he actually stole some com supercomputer time and that's a whole other story, but he, he was very successful in that. He won a Legion of Merit Award, you know, signed by the president, da 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 da. And then, oh, one of the, one of the planes he developed nights and weekends, uh, F-16. Oh, that's, uh, you can look that up if you want, but that's like the, one of the coolest, lowest cost dream planes of any, any fighter pilot guy, F-16. And then, then he retired, and then he developed, devoted his efforts to military strategy and uh, showed, showed the nature of conflict and some other things. But he, he was asked, you know, what, what's a winner? And interestingly enough, he, he came up with a definition that's pretty much a product development definition. So here it is. He said, a winner is someone, individual or group, who can, in a metaphorical sense, build snowmobiles. So take a moment. A snowmobile he was just using as a placeholder uh, for a device that has, if you will, various mechanical components. You could say software, you could say gasoline, you could say tracks, motors, but it has a combination of components that come together in, new, in a new way. Not, so he didn't just say you have to build them. Then he said the, the really important part, and employ them, use them in an appropriate fashion. In, in other words, for a snowmobile, I jumped off this hill and I, catching my buddy and I came down and the thing was still, I was still at full throttle and snow was blowing in my face and whatever, in appropriate fashion. And he said, when facing uncertainty and unpredictable change. So going back to those expectations, it was the same thing of uh, what you might want to build and the people are going to build it and the schedule and the da 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 da. And you, with all those unpredict unpredict unpredictable events, you're still somehow successful. So his definition of winning, I have adopted as a product development commercialization definition as well. So that's Boyd and his, he'll, his work will come up a little bit later. Okay, so I wanna, I'll give you something simple. I wish somebody would have told me this 20 years ago. To define wins, well there's a lot of ways, but I'm gonna give you t just two simple ways. Uh, one from a user experience point of view, and one from a development experience point of view. And the, the MBAs, I don't care about. And the, and the CTOs, I don't care about tonight. I only care about these two groups. So I can pretty much sum summarize it. A user experience definition of winning, so you build a product and the user experience version of winning is a bunch of five-star reviews. Okay, that means that it worked. When they bought it, they thought it was a good price. It got delivered, it's still working. They told their friends, blah, blah, blah. So if you see a bunch of five-star reviews, it's a pretty good indication of a good user experience. I mean, the opposite would be, this was really great, except. That's usually a four-star review. So if you want something just very portable, um, you can say that a good user experience correlates with a bunch of five-star reviews. That's what the user's paying for. Okay, what's, what about the development experience version? The people like us. Well, this is a little team that I sort of headed uh, with, these, with these mass spectrometers. Um, they're complicated pieces of equipment with, you know, there was also new technology, new software, new, new applications, how to use it. And um, these two people were application chemists, so they got, to, they got to work with the unit a year before it was released. So on the planet, they were like you know, two of the most knowledgeable people about that piece of equipment and software. So if you wanted to like train the rest of the world, those are two pretty important people. They have a year's worth of experience on something that's not introduced yet. And then the rest of us were in our own little development area. So um, in this particular group shot, 
we created some multimedia training 20 years ago. Put, I've forgotten exactly, but let's call it 100 plus hours of training or something on us. No, that can't be, that's too much. Two or three hours worth of training on a CD-ROM and then shipped it to all the customers so that when they got their new equipment, they got training from the two people in the world that already had a year of experience. And anyway, we all got along. Um, it was sort of a, almost a, like an unofficial project, something I thought was important, and I just went and did it. So it's, um, and so I would, you know, borrow one person's, you know, a couple hours a week and the graphic artist, you know, a couple hours a week. And, um, Chris and Doug, I'd say, you know, I, I'm going to need you for three days next month and that's it. So, you know, that was like a few hours. So I, I brought them in, used them effectively and released them. So th the end was um, we were a pretty happy group. And sort of a little funny story, the, one of the big conferences during the year happened in June, and one of these was released a few weeks before. And Doug was at the airport, and I th it might have been like uh, New Orleans or something, and as he's coming into the conference, he's seeing you know, some old friends, and they're all smiling at him different this year. And there's some people he doesn't know are smiling at him different this year. And then finally, he can't figure out what, why they're giving him the goofy looks. And they all said, we saw you on the training. And it was like people he never met, but they knew him. It's sort of like, you know, seeing, you know, your favorite TV person or sci-fi person. Anyway, it was, he, he, he got some, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He was a celebrity within this little group <coughs> because of a CD. So anyway, we all had a good time. So we had a, it was a you know, good use of our time. And for me, that was a great development experience, and we sort of captured that with this one photo. Okay, so this um, list, just if, in case you haven't figured it out, means that as a coder, you have lots of responsibilities. One is to you know, go in your room and code. Well, that, that's an easy one. And frequently, that's because you're given specifications. Um, a lot of us prefer to work in isolation or as part of a small group of people that we like. Um, sometimes we're, we get out of there, our little rooms and we're agents in a complex adaptive system. So what that means is what we do impacts you know, marketing and what marketing does impacts us. There's, it, it goes both ways. And what the, what the competition does affects us and what we do affects the competition. So there's that. Um, if you're really good, as a professional, you get to influence the direction of the product, not just be a code monkey and code what you were told, but you can actually say, uh, based on you know, my research, we should be going in this direction. So you can shape, if you have the proper tools and skills, you can shape the direction the product's going. And then, finally, very important, you're an individual with other responsibilities. You'll be on other projects, you might have a life at home, you might want to be learning a new language, but you have other responsibilities. So if the project you're working on is something you don't like, uh, now that the new word this year is not engaged, then it, it gets less of your effort, it gets less of your best. And it gets, you know, like, so what it, you know, it's, it, it compiled, <laughs> you know, whatever. So you have all those things that you have to balance, once again, in this question mark of what is development commercialization. So that's what we're up against. Uh, there's the definition of complex adaptive system, which I just covered. Okay, a few years ago there was this other guy, uh, Taleb, and he, he was interested in, in how things worked, and he wrote this book called Antifragile, and I'm just going to give her like one or two points from that. He said that a development environment could be classified as fragile, and essentially what that means to us is, if one thing goes wrong, there's a big chain reaction and the project's late or the project's over budget or whatever, that's fragile. He talked about robust and resilient, which I'm going to skip. And then he talked about antifragile. Antifragile is a condition where if there's a little bit of stress, the group performs better. If there's a little bit of uncertainty, the group finds new amazing workarounds. So part of the book is about what does it take to get from fragile to antifragile, where you work better than you did before. Um, mostly 
Let's go over this quickly. Doesn't welcome disorder. Um, things go bad quickly and fragile. Uh, said that already. Oh, and this is, this is a story I've never told in public. Ah. This represents a $475 million keychain. I have one of the few around. Now, if you want, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you hold it. But $475 million, it's not the only one, but not very many of them. And the basic thing was, if you remember about 15 or 20 years ago, uh, the, the development of group at Intel was getting jerked around internally. I knew some of the people that worked there. And someone basically said, you know, they forgot to fill in the rest of a table. And then in the multiplier section, uh, they came up with some wrong answers. And, and then that meant in some spreadsheets, you got the wrong answer. And uh, it only happened in a few cases, but it, it was a big deal. They had to call all those processors back, so that was an early Pentium. And um, it was this thing of fragile. One, one bad thing happened, and uh, somebody, I, I've never heard the rest of the story, some executive at Intel basically said, we're going to take those processors and we're going to make keychains out of them. So this is the $475 million keychain. So once again, you can look at that rare item. That's fragile. Um, and if you're in a fragile environment, not likely to thrive. And I talked about antifragile, and we'll move through that. Okay, this is a picture that I just sort of composited to say what, a, what an environment may look like. A typical coding environment might look something like this, where you have some people around desks, just actually just looks like, a lot like last night, uh, some whiteboards. And these people all look and dress, you know, sort of the same. These are the coders. So um, how do they improve their ability to survive and thrive? So that's the beat of the talk. And, and I sort of gave you part of the answer is they develop better, better options. Instead of just doing what they're told, they get to input a little bit. So they contribute in new ways. Um, and these development options aren't just choices like, um, like steak, steak or chicken kind of choices. Um, so they're, they're more than just plain old A, B choices. They're not real options where you just delay the decision until the last moment. They're not like stocks where you buy at a later date. And it's not just A, B testing. It's more than that. As a developer, you can develop your options. If you've just mastered this new language that has great database access, you can say, instead of what we were going to do, we can do it this way. Uh, or there's, there's some, a decision coming up, and I don't know which is right, but we can develop two of them, and we can test it. So the, the whole idea of development options is you develop new possibilities, hopefully with some new tests, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how to how you actually go about doing that, but the, that's a key, key phrase. And the, the basic thing I've sort of hinted at, uh, these accelerate learning, and uh, they help make you more adaptive is the, is the key item. So what you want to do is improve your ability to execute more attractive development options. And the, the next six items, which is, once again, the meat of the talk. I'm going to briefly introduce something called requisite variety. I'm going to introduce a concept I've been working on called pair development. Uh, I'm going to hit a little bit on disintermediation, harmony and synergy over something called suboptimization. I'm going to perhaps put a new spin on the word recursion. And I'm going to finish up that section with mismatch detection over error propagation. So these are things I've been t trying to make short, short little talks about to say, I'm not just going to tell you develop better options. I want to tell you some things you can do to get there. So requisite variety. Um, once again, it could be a big deal. There's, a, there's an equation, but basically it says somehow in your development environment, you have more potential responses 
then there are potential problems. So that's essentially what the definition says. And uh, W. Rush Ashby is the guy if you want to look it up. Um, but greater repertoire is typically good. And then uh, this is a picture I've not seen. I, I created this one. But um, the basic idea is if the, if the task you're working on requires skills in orange, yellow, and blue, and you got two people on your team, but no one person has all three of those, then you somehow have to work together to get those three so that together you have the requisite variety, the required variety to solve whatever this problem was. One person couldn't do it, but together, combined, they, could, they, they achieved requisite variety by combining. That's, that's the visual definition of requisite variety. And typically that means you have to work with somebody that's not a clone of you, they're going to have some differences. Um, sometimes you get there by additional training, sometimes you get there by pulling in an expert, sometimes you get there through cooperation, but the point is uh, without requisite variety you're going to be blocked or take too long. With requisite variety there's at least one answer available in your skill set between your group. <clears throat> and one of the other things that's pretty, pretty, you know, past the beginner level is if you just say, oh, I've seen that problem before, I know on Stack Overflow I'm going to copy this code, that's a pattern I've seen before, I paste it in, hi, it works. Well, that's just pattern matching. And that might be the in, insufficient response, but you're not smart enough to know it because you, don't, you haven't had enough requisite, you don't have requisite variety. So there's that to wor worry about. Uh, fragile is also, you know, once again, a bad thing. And then this thing, uh, you, you don't want excessive variety. If there's too many opinions, you can't get anything done. So this, this phrase is pretty, pretty smartly named. It's called requisite variety. It's like just enough. Not too much, not too little. It's the uh, Goldilocks one, you know, just enough. So there's that. And it's the basic thing is it ensures adaptability. Um, you amplify the good, attenuate the bad, and that's the definition of requisite variety. The next one is pair development. And pair development is when you need to move beyond what everybody else has been doing, what's been documented, what the familiar patterns are. So the, the, the visual on that is uh, one guy says, oh, I've studied the problem and the problem is in the shape of a triangle. And the, and the other guy says, no, no, I've studied the problem and it's a, it's a square with an X through it. And they each have argue vehemently and then they realize what, what they, the, the problem they've been looking at is really a pyramid. And they go, oh, it's a pyramid and I thought anyway once you get putting together two different viewpoints produces a new perspective in this case a sort of a 3d perspective of the problem but that's what I've defined as pair development uh, which is typically an intersection of disciplines so you might have a developer and a designer you might have a marketer and a and a coder and, and typically they don't show each other their PowerPoints this is typically most effectively done at a whiteboard together where you're saying, you know, let me talk about this problem, let's work through it, let's bounce some ideas. And you might spend, you know, half hour, then you go on about your business. That's what this, this is how I envision this technique. Once again, this is something I've defined and, you know, made the cartoon. So if you don't like it, I'm, I'm to blame. And uh, the big thing is, it's a synthesis of new options. And with the, with the, complementary perspectives, it has the potential to self-correct someone's focus and their direction. Once again, if, if the first guy would have continued to think it was a triangle, he would not been reach his potential to win. But when he sees it as a pyramid, it's, he, he, was self he, he was corrected and he moved on stronger. Okay, and if you want a Star Trek analogy, here it is. So uh, there was this post, and these people are arguing. It's probably on a Slack channel or something. But uh, one person says, you know, if you could have any 
you know, Star Trek person to help you, what, they were arguing between who would they want, Kirk or Spock. And you can just sort of guess why they were arguing. And then I, I basically said, I, I don't want Spock or Kirk. I want Spock and Kirk. So you, they have different viewpoints. And it wasn't like Spock gets it and then Kirk, you know, gets a memo. I don't want that. I went the other way around. I want them in the room exchanging heated opinions, coming up with a new solution. That's, so this is a television version of pair development. A little bit different perspectives comes together, better solution. Um, oh, it's not cross-training. Spock's not learning to be captain and Kirk's not learning to be a science officer. They're just coming up with a brand new solution. So not cross-training. And I covered that. Oh. Um, mm, yeah, once again, this goes beyond pattern matching. So that's the summary for pair development. Oh, and there's availability bias is a fancy name for, uh, you present it with a problem, you go to the first thing that pops into your head, you think that must be the best solution because it's the first thing that popped into your head. That's called availability bias. And what you, what you learn is often your first, first thing you thought of is not the best. So that's a, just a fancy word for that kind of pattern matching. And once again, you hopefully reduce that with pair development. Okay, disintermediation is a nice big word. Um, let's see what that is. Uh, means remove the layers between individual contributors and data. Uh, I, at one point in my career, it was sort of weird. If I wanted to talk to somebody in R and D, uh, when I when I came there, you just walked over and talked. But then various people got territorial a few years later. And these one set of managers, if I wanted to talk to someone in R&D, I had to make a formal request to my boss, who made a formal request to their boss, who talked to the person, and they would try to come up with a solution while I had to stay at my desk. And it was like pretty, pretty stupid. So disintermediation is the opposite of that. If I need to talk to Zach, I go talk to Zach. Uh, I check to see if he's busy, I, I'm polite, I'm courteous, but I talk to Zach, not to, not to the, the other way. And it removes the decisions, barriers, so that things get done faster. So that's disintermediation. And how do you, how do you get that? Well, uh, there's a, the, the, the key thing is, one, you can exchange documents. That's not the best way. That means somebody has to spend time writing those documents and interpreting those documents. So if you want the fast track to facilitate disintermediation, you talk to them face to face. And then if you want to see how customers think about your stuff, you can also have intermediation barriers between you and customers. So the, the way to fast track that is, instead of getting reports about customers, you go out and meet one. So that's dis disintermediation on the customer level, disintermediation on the colleague level. Once again, we'll just do a little high level overview. Okay, this one's sort of fun. Um, harmony and synergy, uh, to, well, at least one of those words you may not know very well. But uh, to give you a, a fast track on that, uh, there's a little, little section of the score from Handel's Messiah. And if some of you are musicians, you realize that there are four parts there. Soprano, um, alto, tenor, bass. And if I were to say one, two, three, four, sing. Could you do it? If you were the soprano, da 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 da, could you do it? Well, no, you'd have the training. Okay. Uh, so that's, in some ways, that's what it's like when I say, you four guys work together on this project. It's like, how could you be cooperative, let alone harmonious, if you haven't, you haven't invested properly? You know, been trained properly. So when you put these four things together, it sounds pretty nice. And then you put an orchestra behind that, it sounds even better. And that's this, this concept of orchestration is what you'd like a development environment to work like. You'd like marketing and engineering to occasionally get together and work to produce something useful, which is opposed to the Dilbert version of those things. Okay, so that's harmony. I uh, can spend more time, but I'm going to move on. 
Synergy is more fun. Synergy is beyond harmony. Harmony means that you're just working together and that pretty much means you're singing the same tune. We know, we know it's hallelujah. Uh, we know it's in a certain key, key of D. And there's a certain time signature and da 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 And it, actually it's very, the requirements are pretty much specified on that sheet of paper. Synergy is more fun. Synergy is when the output is greater than the predicted, uh, predicted outcome based on the components. In other words, uh, it's sort of like the idea of Spock and Kirk. When you put them together, you get more than the two individuals. So uh, I've illustrated synergy in this diagram, network diagram, of these two guys are standing a little taller and they're bathed in light. They're producing something more than they could have individually uh, and that's synergy. So that's, just, once again, this page is just definitions. So the question is, how do you do that? Get these here. Um, one is you improve group communication. So um, I'll give you a silly example. Um, during my career, uh, at the end of a, near the end of a project, we also need a beauty shots of these uh, mass spectrometers. And we used to pay pay the guy like ten or twenty thousand dollars to you know set up for a couple days and take these pictures and they would go on the brochures the shiny brochures but uh, we in post sales that was pre-sales we in post sales also needed pictures but the guy that was spending the ten thousand bucks never said hey guys do you well I got the stuff in the room would you like some pictures so he would never even tell us when he was taking the pictures he would never offer to share the you know, five minutes of the photographer's time. So it was just bad communication. So when we needed our pictures, we had to go round up the equipment again next week. So just a silly example, but improved, group, improved communication would have made everyone have better use of the pictures. That's the same with code or, you know, other things. Um, another one is you need someone to, you know, put together people that need to chat. So someone says, I heard you were doing databases and you were doing a different kind of database. Maybe you should have lunch. So someone shapes that interaction. And then just to round up your vocabulary, uh, synergy means a more positive outcome than predicted by the components. And there's an opposite of that. When I work with you, I get nothing done. That is a word is called dysergy. So we shouldn't work together. <laughs> I'm not picking on you. But um, that's dysergy. So if you need the, the opposite, that, that's, you get less when you put two people together. That's not good. So if you're the, the shaper of this organization, we don't work together. That's fine. Now we have words to, to go with it. Um, and then so, sort, of a, the oppo sort of the opposite is called suboptimization, where uh, you polish your, your code so that it runs 10% faster, 20% faster, and it's checked in. And, but meanwhile, I can't ship because uh, this, this guy didn't do something. So you can sub-optimize all you want, but it, in, in terms of getting it to the customer, it doesn't matter because we, we lost over here. So, um, or it's also known as local optimum. But the idea in commercialization, you want five-star reviews if it's all not working. Um, we all lose. Um, and then I've gone on to the next one here. Recursion is solving problems of the same type. So one version of testing is, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to performance test my search speed or whatever. But another version is in commercialization. So early in the product development, you have a few people, and you might only have documents, but you test that with a customer. And one of the things you want to do is learn how the customer, what vocabulary the customer is going to use. So that you learn early. Late in the product, you want to make an advertisement, you need to learn what language the customer uses. It's exactly the same problem. So recursion means you're solving the problem of what languages the customer uses at the beginning, the middle, and the end. You're solving a problem of the same type. Well, how does the customer talk about this or how does the customer do his work or whatever those things are but recursion is something that helps you make good use of your 
your efforts. And here's a, uh, see how clever you are, but here's a visual example of recursion. Anybody see it? What do you see? Oh, you were just yawning, I'm sorry. What, anybody see the recursion? Yes. In the photo, it has a photo of what they're doing. Yes. So what they're doing in the lab mimics what the customer's doing in the, in the inset picture. And if you could look further, there would be another version of the picture. So that's, that's a, another conception of recursion, but it's solving the problem the same type in a visual kind of way. So that's recursion, good thing. Um, I'm just going to finish these up. Mismatch is an important quality to have in commercialization. W with all these people that you might be working with, there's a lot of opinions, and it's usually they start with, I know for sure, whatever, or the research is proven, whatever. Um, there's, there's those opinions, how, how regardless of how forcefully they're stated, and there's actual reality. And you can have an argument over lunch, and I'll uh, sort of cut a short story short here, but I was involved in a project where there was some uh, intellectual uh, dueling, and I quickly realized that no amount of dueling was gonna come to any good, good outcome. It would just be a waste of my time as well. So uh, it was turned out it was, a, it was a user interface problem. And uh, the person that designed the user interface, I thought, had done a terrible job. But this was a very well-respected coder that didn't really have user, experience, user interface experience, but he was free for a couple months. And our group said it was terrible, and they said, Tom did it, and it's great. And I, it doesn't matter what the argument was. Uh, we were told that the product was going to ship with that interface, so sh shut up and develop the training based on that interface. Well, it was coming up on the end of the year, and we, we didn't like it, and argue it wasn't going to work. So uh, finally they said, uh, Mark, if you don't like it, you got 30 days to win this argument, which was supposed to make me shut up and, you know, go home for the Christmas or whatever. So instead, uh, what I did was I developed two interactive prototypes, uh, one with their interface and one with my interface. And uh, then I got 19 pseudo customers, uh, 19 people, some of which were internal, some of which were customers, and I basically asked them to do tasks with version A and version B. I did metrics, timed them how errors and how fast and blah, blah, blah. And uh, in the end, uh, 18 of the 19 preferred version B and the one person didn't want to be politically committed so he didn't vote for anybody. Uh, but anyway, no votes for A. So I, w I went 30 days later when I was ordered, summoned to appear, presented my interactive results that they didn't know I was doing, and uh, was ready for a fight. And the head of the, depart head of the group said, B wins, let's go. So anyway, uh, the problem was I detected a mismatch not by arguing, but by, in this case, A-B testing an interactive version with metrics, with errors, with speed, proved that B was better. I detected the mismatch. And the interesting part of the story, for me, is uh, I finished this in 1999 on, a, on this product that I've been involved with from day one. So I had a, was very invested in the product. I was the first post-sales support engineer to develop the strategy worldwide for this product. So I was pretty attached to this product. And now it's uh, 2016, and that interface is still being made today. So the work I did to win version B is, is still, being, still in manufacturing today. So this little thing of mismatch, sometimes it has long dividends. So, um, you can detect mismatches you know, on your own smarts, or you can get other people to help you. And if you don't detect mismatches, errors get propagated, and the potential for winning goes down. 
So once again, this, this is just an introduction to the term, but mismatch detection is a big deal. Okay, so I've, we're pretty much in the last few minutes of the talk. I've given you six approaches to win. I'll just review those briefly. <clears throat> One is requisite variety. Just enough different opinions. You might have to work with you know, a marketing guy for a half an hour at a whiteboard, but you get a different perspective. And the, the, the phrase to describe that is called requisite variety. It has an academic tradition. So you know, it's just not some you know, fad of the day, but it's a real thing. Uh, pair development is something I've, I'm championing where two people get together to create something new beyond the, the, the previous pattern, something novel. Disintermediation is going to the source to speed things up for yourself, to clear up any misconceptions. Uh, harmony and synergy. Uh, I give the example of Hallelujah where I can't just ask four of you to sing Hallelujah Chorus. I gotta prepare you, I gotta pick the right four people. If I pick the right four people, it's gonna come out better. If I give you a little training, it's gonna come out better. And then synergy, if I shape your interaction a little better, the results are gonna be better than, better than individual components, that's synergy. And um, if you've ever been involved with synergy, it's a, one of the best feelings of your life. You go, I work with Bill today, and we did some amazing things. That's, that's sort of a description of what it feels like in synergy. Or flow is, is another word, sort of related. And then mismatch detection is taking, taking a statement that you, you, you're told is true or you should believe it and going, you know what, we need to test that. We need to check the interactions. We need to put a customer in front of this. We need to you know, time it with a stopwatch. We need to do something and see if there's a mismatch. Uh, otherwise, you know, the wrong things get built. Okay, so once again, the last couple slides. Um, another author has taken a look at this kind of problem, and uh, he wrote this popular book called Drive by Daniel Pink, who uh, early in life was a lawyer, uh, but he, he's come to see the light here. Um, he, he decided, based on his research and others, that the three factors that drive coders and, and other people doing uh, intellectual, what do they call it? it? Work that requires a rudimentary cognitive ability. Okay? In other words, something more than flipping burgers. Um, but he says that what drives us are three characteristics, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And autonomy means if I think you're messing up, I, I have the, the autonomy, the capability for self-direction to go, you know, write a, develop a little new user interface and go test it with customers. Um, I have the autonomy to learn a new language and see if the database access is better. But I'm not just told to shut up and do my job. But autonomy is I have, you're trusting my brain a little bit to also go out and find, find solutions. That's autonomy. Mastery is the, the basic thing of, uh, last year I was d beginner at uh, Swift and OX, I, iOS stuff, and you know, now I've gone up two notches. I'm, I'm a, little more, a little more mastery. So mastery is I'm getting better at my, little, my own craft, and perhaps mastery is I'm getting a little better at interacting with my colleagues to commercialize this product. And then purpose is uh, the basic idea of the work I'm doing is important. So uh, when I was working on these, these products and you know somebody was curing cancer and somebody was uh, you know analyzing, analyzing the, the, the spill from a ship or something, it was important work. So purpose means that you know, my, the, the stuff I'm doing gets you know, used and valued. That's the idea of purpose. So, uh, Dan Pink basically said these are the three factors that drive engagement or motivation. Um, <clears throat> and what I've given you in those six, six items is a way to help say, if I want more autonomy, I might try, I might have to actually do requisite variety. I might have to pair with somebody to get more information. I might have to um, interact with that guy from marketing if I'm trying to win a marketing argument, but whatever. So anyway, you could... This is a nice book to read if you also want some ideas on what motivates people that do more, than, more work than rudimentary cognition. 
Okay, so here's the, here's the sort of the takeaway. <coughs> I've uh, been struggling for months trying to, to, trying to find words for this that are just real simple. So these are the two words I've, I've adopted. Um, so I'm sort of testing them out with you tonight, uh, first time. Uh, the two words are focus and expectations. So earlier I gave you a, a, my definition of my set of items for expectation. And I said that was um, what should we build? What's going to be important a year from now? Uh, what's the competition going to be doing a year from now? What technology is going to be important a year from now? It's what should we build long term? And <clears throat> I, I gave you the basic ideas. The, the two extremes are you could be told by the product, product master, project leader, CTO, whatever, that this will be important, shut up and just do it. That's one extreme. Or you could say, given this basic set of boundary conditions, I'm going to help shape the answer. So that's the expectations about what could we build in a year if with all the mergers and reacquisitions in a presidential election and everything else, what could we actually do? So all that's in expectation. But focus is short term. Focus means what's important today. So uh, the, 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 the short version of that is, you know, doing your, you know, becoming a better coder, that's important today. But spending a half an hour with somebody from marketing, probably should make that investment too. Uh, so that you can once again understand in a, a, a better perspective, so that you can be a, you know, a, a better contributor to the conversation, uh, more respected opinion. So that's, so focus is not just, it should be something more than uh, we got a backlog arranged by value, <coughs> code word, somebody guessed, <coughs> and based on the backlog, uh, he got number. He got the top, and I, I came in five minutes late, so I get the second one. I, I want something a little more substantial than that. So focus should be what you know, what's important, and once again, with informed opinions about what you're trying to do, how you interact, you can make a better, better short-term decision. And expectations I talked about, um, but it's this idea of what should we build, and then I haven't completely, completely um, come up with a great visualization for this yet, but this is the, my key insight actually last night. Whenever someone talks about expectations, uh, they frequently draw a little place on a, on a paper, and if they're a product manager, they, they call it a roadmap. Um, sort, of, sort of the idea of, if I want to go to Chicago, I know where Chicago is. Uh, I just follow the map and I get to Chicago. But the problem is Chicago doesn't move. Okay? But products, a year from now, we don't know where they're going to be a year from now because they don't exist yet. Uh, we don't know what, what our development situation, if the budget got slashed, if we, we ran out of seats in our room, if there was a merger. We, there's a whole bunch of things we don't know. So. The, the next version of this picture, <clears throat> this expectation box, which is this, this top one, is actually going to be going to be moving around. It's, it might, might jump or something in the next version because we don't know what's going to be in a year with all that, that big list I gave you. Um, I, I illustrated a little bit here. If you notice, this timeline has a bend in it, and that's where uh, expectations changed. Let's say the your competitor, th that could have been um, Nokia when the, I, when the iPhone was released, they suddenly realized that they should have changed. Well, they were too slow, but uh, it's a, the, the bend there represents a change. And if you want to use Eric, Eric um, Reese's Lean Startup terminology, you could call it a pivot, but it's basically just a, a new enlightenment you changed. So anyway, the next version of this picture is going to be the target's going to be moving randomly because there's all those expectations change so if, if you're working from from a set of requirements that says in a year this is what you're going to need you should hopefully now be a little smarter to go those aren't requirements those are 
hypotheses, their guesses, their projections based on unknowns and uncertainties. So the next version of this is going to be moving, but um, that's what I have today. Okay, so some of what I've been talking about is you know, lessons learned from the last 20, 30 years. Um, I'm working on this book called Developing Winners. Uh, it has some stories in there about John Boyd, the, the pilot, aircraft designer, and military strategist I told you about. So hopefully the book will be out <coughs> later this year. So there's a, a site where that's happening. And once again, the title of the talk was from coding to commercialization to give you a, a broader idea of how you as a coder might fit into a successful, so that you could shape a successful commercialization effort, be a valued part of that community, perhaps you know, shape a few things, derive a little joy, and go beyond surviving to thriving.